Hi, everybody. Did everybody enjoy that uh, slideshow? I hope so. Um, well, good evening and good afternoon to some of you. Uh, thanks for joining us from across the continent and for some of you, uh, especially our presenter, Nicholas Vass, um, from across the Atlantic. My name is Liz Park and I am the curator at the University at Buffalo Art Galleries. You know what? I'm going to stop sharing <laughs> there. Um, so for our near, uh, so my name is Liz Park, the curator at University at Buffalo Art Galleries, and I have the great pleasure of welcoming everyone to this event. For our audiences near and far, I'd like to begin by acknowledging that we are hosting this event from the traditional territory of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy. The organizers of today's program and I honor the sovereignty of the Mohawk, Cayuga, Onondaga, Oneida, Seneca, and Tuscarora nations. And I begin with this acknowledgement as a way to recommit to our collective work as curators, historians, artists, and educators whose work must be informed by the intertwined histories of colonialism and various systems of oppression, as well as their ongoing realities. UB Art Galleries, as part of a research university, is committed to making safe spaces for those who seek understanding through art and culture, where learning is cumulative, collaborative, it involves making mistakes. And it is in the spirit of collective and empowered learning that I welcome all of you to the first of many programs UB Art Galleries will be presenting around the history of Tolstoy College, an anarchist educational community that was part of UB from 1969 to 1985. So we have invited Art and Research Group Collective Question to organize a series of summer programs leading up to an exhibition for the fall of 2020 so we have Julie Nimi, Chris Lee, and Steve Chodorowski, who are the members of Collective Question, who will share with us how they came to form this unusual group, among other things. But I first heard about Collective Question in Tolstoy College about a year ago when I was preparing to move to Buffalo for this job. A colleague named Rachel Valensky forwarded me the link to the very informative New Yorker article about the college written by Jennifer Wilson, one of our esteemed speakers today. And since my arrival here in Buffalo, I've been picking up bits and pieces of its history. Whenever I meet colleagues at UB who say that they've been at the university for a long time, I would ask if they know about Tolstoy College. And most of the time, and to my disappointment, the answer was no. So why dig up this little known history? Why invite collective question to make trouble? Why is this relevant here and now and at an art organization? Tolstoy College is the seed that germinated many inquiries and movements at UB and beyond. For instance, gender and sexuality studies it was an emergent field of scholarship that the college helped precipitate at UB. And on and off campus, the college led anti-war activism and encouraged students to participate in the city's many emergent food cooperatives. The college opened up radical new possibilities to pursue alternative models of learning, working, and being. And they asked difficult questions that we continue to ask today. How do we understand the cultural construct of masculinity and misogynist and patriarchal societies? How do we understand pacifism when the state is sanctioning violence through the military and the police? Tolstoy College imagined and modeled worlds with an unwavering conviction that I think is characteristic of artists, creative, expressive, inquisitive, and irrepressible. 35 years after it closed its doors, we are revisiting and celebrating the college because it matters more and more that we look at not only what we learn, but how we learn. And it matters more and more to us curators, artists, writers, that we, um, and anyone invested in the arts, that we look at how existing systems of knowledge can be redesigned, realigned, and reimagined to unfetter creativity from serving oppressive systems of authority. Before I turn it over to Julie, Chris, and Steve for 
for their introduction to Tolstoy College. I want to thank the support of our gallery staff, Bob Scalise, the director, Lynn Lasota, the finance manager, Emily Reynolds, marketing manager, who is making our event technically possible tonight, and Jillian Daniels, our student assistant for the semester. We'd also like to acknowledge the support of the university archives, especially Bill Offhouse, who granted us permission to use some of the marvelous images from Tolstoy College's archive, if you've been following us on Instagram. And a few housekeeping notes, a reminder that tonight's program will be approximately 90 minutes and is being recorded. Please keep your microphone mute to avoid background noise and use the chat box for any questions to the speakers and the organizers. Jill will be monitoring the chat box for questions throughout the symposium to forward to our moderators. Thank you again for joining us and I'll turn it over to Julie. Um, first off, hi everyone that I can see and not see um, here on Zoom. Um, I'm really happy that uh, everyone, you know, took time out of their day today to join us in this space, um, you know, during a very kind of difficult time in the world to say the least. Um, and I also just really want to extend my gratitude to Liz, Jillian, Emily, and all the panelists, especially, um, for taking, you know, time out of their evening to really kind of share four very different yet somehow related through, I would say, hopes for, um, hopes and necessary needs for uh, a better future and ways of organizing ourselves um, through kinship, community, and really questions of, uh, of the urgency of how to do so right, both right now and historically. So um, I'm really appreciative for everyone just for uh, coming together to kind of think together and individually and hopefully this will be kind of the beginning of many conversations as Liz mentioned, just moving into uh, a year-long project with Buffalo. So in a way, this is a homecoming of sorts for Tolstoy College. And um, one that is, uh, you know, very, very needed to kind of go back to the beginnings of it and to really look at it um, and spend time with this topic in the place in which it originated. Um, so I'm Julie. <laughs> um, I'm part of Collective Question with Steve and Chris. Um, and I just thought it would be helpful very briefly just to kind of give you an overview of what we do and how we started to do it and then let Steve and Chris kind of give more details as they speak. But um, we joined together as a collective, an artist collective um, in 2017. Um, all not really, I didn't know Chris and Steve, Steve and Chris met each other through Buffalo, but we were all in our own way working on this topic. And we each kind of have different perspectives with how we met, but uh, it kind of came around the point of there were certain archive boxes that were checked out at Buffalo and then the curiosity that sparked as to where those archival boxes were. <laughs> so, um, so it's an interesting thing, you know, about the process of research and, and, you know, who's looking at it. And sometimes it can feel, you know, long-term academic research can feel sometimes very uh, individual and very siloed. So um, my perspective and my sort of history with this project was I was a graduate student at the Center for Curatorial Studies at Bard College and was really interested in, um, you know, these questions of what is it to have collectivity and kinship and radicalism within an institution. So that was kind of honestly my baseline question. And I knew that I was interested in looking at kind of historical examples of such. Um, so through this process, I started working with um, a few artists and researchers while at Bard, Jen actually being one of them, um, to look at different facets of the archives and create kind of a set of research questions that specifically kind of spiraled out of Tolstoy College. Um, as Liz mentioned, you know, Tolstoy College was this educational um, anarchist community at the University of Buffalo that was one of nine different colleges. And um, they were, you know, a collective of, um, of students and faculty that were really invested in these questions of how to live and what to live for. And also really um, invested in, in alternative ways of organizing themselves in and within and without an institution. Um, 
And so I began really looking at this from the perspective of a graduate student um, as a curatorial student and as a way of kind of utilizing this very unique history. Um, and, you know, as one does with the process of research, you start to notice that there are a lot of other communities that existed as well. So this is one of thousands of stories. Um, and that should always, you know, be something that is remembered that it's one little moment in history and one that kind of continues through the relationships and the network of relationships that come out of out of that particular history. Um, so yeah, so I, uh, I started to do this research and started to really talk to some of the former members of Tolstoy College, which I'm not sure if there are any in, in the audience today, but if so, please, please let us know, um, you know, later on in the program, just to sort of understand um, how and what this community looked like and really kind of scouring different archival materials to understand what the makeup of the classroom was and what the particular, uh, you know, organizing structure of those classrooms looked like. Um, and so I'll just sort of stop there for now um, and turn it over to, I believe, Steve, just to fill in a little bit more about um, the particular our particular approach to this and um you know hopefully we'll have more chance to more of a chance to talk together soon so thank you thanks julie um so yeah i'll just continue the sort of like uh origin story of collective question a little bit um just by speaking a bit to my entry point here so like julie mentioned um uh we we kind of found each other because we were looking up boxes in the archives and finding that someone else had checked them out and Steve and I were like, who the hell else is looking at this stuff? <laughs> right now? And it turned out later uh, that it was Julian. We, we connected through Ekram, who's also on the call, curator at Squeaky Wheel. Um, but anyway, um, my, my entry point was I, I, I was teaching at UB in the art department uh, up until about a year ago. Um, and I uh, uh, ran a reading group with a, a few grad students um, where <clears throat> we were reading about anarchism um, through uh, you know, a handful of texts. Uh, and one of the texts that came up uh, through a grad student named Carl Spartz, um, who graduated a, a few years ago, but is in Texas, he's in Texas now. Um, he he uh, forwarded us uh, Jen's article and um, it just blew me away. I was like, well, <laughs> you know, I, I'd been there already for maybe that was my second or third year and had no idea this was going on. And so um, it was just a really sort of uh, inspiring example because it, you know, located in the in located in the place where I was. You know, not too far away, like literally, space, you know, in terms of like the buildings, um, that that these kinds of things were possible. That it was possible to sort of organize a kind of educational project around the principles of anarchism, um, and and so I started to look at the uh, the archival materials. I was looking particularly for um, syllabi, um, just this just to see like how, you know, how did they write? So, you know, this, this is one of the things that I hate most as an educator is, is writing syllabi. <laughs> and, uh, you know, we have a whole thing about that. But um, so I wanted to look at how they wrote syllabi and there were just some amazing examples. I mean, Jill, Jill's background, you can see it's not a syllabus, but it's a, it's a poster for a, a course that's, you know, in the form of a, a comic, right, about, um, uh, you know, uh, the sort of geopolitical hierarchy. Uh, um, but, you know, there were also examples of syllabi that were written as poems. There were examples of uh, grading rubrics that were written as jokes, right? The, the ways that the sort of like conventional features of uh, syllabus were treated were uh, treated with some irreverence and in, in iconoclasm. So anyway, it was inspiring for me because um, I wondered like why why can't we do this now? And so this question of like wh how to sort of re, re revive or reconstitute Tolstoy College is for me like one of the uh, uh, interesting sort of creative questions that I think uh, collective question undertakes. I, mean, I think I think the in one way we think about all of our sort of um, convenings as uh, sort of temporary reconstitutions of the college in, in the way that we sort of try to you know think about the archive, you know, not as a sort of like static thing in the past, but something we try to live now and, and learn from. Um, so I'll leave it at that and, and uh, pass it on to Steve. Yeah, there was, there was a day in uh, 2017 in March 
when uh, uh, I uh, was able to uh, acquire a, um, a 45 uh, by the name of, uh, which was called Hayes Hall Blues. Um, and um, being myself in Buffalo at the time, uh, and actually having an office in Hayes Hall in the School of Architecture and Planning, um, I proceeded to play Hayes Hall Blues on loop in the atrium uh, of Hayes Hall um, as a sort of commemorative, maybe commemorative, as a, a commemorative reconstitution, you know, of, of that event. That's the thing that you heard if you came in a little bit early, that was this, the, 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 the recording of the recording uh, in Hayes Hall, a little bit echoey, people coming by asking, what is this? Who is that? I know that, like, I've heard that somewhere before. Um, um, and just for a little bit of context, that, that piece uh, was produced uh, during a time of uh, significant campus unrest in 1970. Uh, for a specific encounter with, uh, where faculty and students came to Hayes Hall, where the, 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 um, the president of the university at the time, uh, his office was, and they came to talk to him and uh, were proceeded to be arrested. And the uh, recording was then um, uh, produced to defray legal costs uh, to the best, to, 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 to my understanding. And maybe Mike can actually speak to that even better than I can, but um, that, that this is as an artifact be not just treated as, as archive, uh, as celebration, but also start to become um, activated in the space. Um, I'll leave it at that for now, um, but we can continue to talk about that maybe through some of the work um, of, our, of, our, uh, of our guests as well. Cool. Um, so, Okay, so one of the things I guess I also want to mention, and then I'm going to turn the floor over to our four panelists for the for the evening. But um, I guess one of the things too that we have really honed in on, or it's an ethos, I guess that's a better word, um, for how we like to kind of organize ourselves as a collective and how we like to approach research, and also what. I think the three of us and many who approach the archive of Tolstoy College can, can see is that there's really this spirit of working together. And, um, and I really fully do believe in that in the sense that like no work is ever done alone, you know? And so, especially with, with research, it's, it's like there's constantly gaps and holes and unknowns and blind spots and it's, it's interesting to bring people into to a research, prog uh, research project and do a research question to see where those kind of gaps and unknowns can be filled in. So that's kind of how we came to organize this symposium today of opening it up. And, you know, you on this panel, there's two separate panels. Um, we're first going to hear from Jennifer Wilson and from Nicholas Voss, where they'll speak to the tensions of anarchism and education. And then um, followed by another panel with Michael Bazinski and Camila Janan Rashid, who will speak more to the uh, themes and tensions around poetry and policy. But um, you know, it's it's interesting because we work kind of as artists, as researchers, as curators, as writers, as all of these sort of hats that I'm sure many on this Zoom can can relate to. You know, but the interesting thing is just seeing where we can kind of find new themes to look at and new questions and new thoughts and sort of pass that on to a collaborator that we bring on. And we've worked with Camila before as well as Jen and as with Michael. Um, thanks for joining us, Nicholas, as a, as a new member. Um, but, you know, to just kind of like present new, new perspectives on the archive and on the research and on their own research that somehow builds onto the new archive of Tolstoy College and onto the new archive of questions that we have of how to live, what to live for, what is state power, what is power, what is the university, et cetera, et cetera. Lots of big questions, I know. Um, but anyway, I, I think it's important to, uh, I'll, I'll sort of just speak very briefly to the first panel with Jen and with Nick. Um, as I mentioned before, I worked with Jen on the CCS Bard. Uh, it was both an exhibition that I did and also a publication, which is, here kind of in the background, um, but also if anyone's interested, I have PDFs left of it. But um, Jen and I actually go back many, many years. Uh, we met 
working for Barack Obama in 2008 as volunteers, I believe. And then you we, worked as a volunteer. I just showed up at a party. That's right. Okay. Thank you, Jen. <laughs> so uh, I met Jen as a very young person working for Obama and uh, was introduced again to her research on Tolstoy College through the New Yorker article in 2015. And uh, you know, immediately as a new uh, student at, at uh, the Center for Curatorial Studies, reached out to her uh, about this particular article and therefore began two years of kind of back and forth of what this is. And Jen kind of, I guess, shepherded me through the project and kind of helped again fill in gaps around Tolstoy as an educator and also around archival materials. So it was also in her generosity that I really was able to dive into this and open this up and really think about opening this up to other to other people as well. Um, so Jen today is going to talk a little bit about her experience of research on Tolstoy College and also her experience, I believe, with Leo Tolstoy as a figure very briefly in 10 minutes, but hell, we're going to do it. And then after Jen speaks, um, we're going to hear from Nicholas Voss, who's going to give more of kind of a narrative survey of his education in the UK from 2010 to now, specifically thinking about framing of this topic around austerity, resistance, um, to it from the experience of an anarchist free school based in squats in central London at the time. Um, so I want to turn the floor over now to Jen and uh, let her take it from here. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Um, this is just so unbelievable to me. When I wrote this piece, I thought maybe someone will retweet it on Twitter. Um, <laughs> Um, I didn't imagine that there would be many years later, like an entire conference um, about Tolstoy College. Um, but I think that helps me maybe understand like how some of the Tolstoy College folks felt when I called them in 2015. Like I think I called Charles Plank, who had not been associated with Tolstoy College for oh, almost 50 years at that point. And I told him, I said, hi, I'm writing a story about you for the New Yorker. Would you do you have a few minutes to speak? Um, so, um, so I think that, um, yeah, no, this is all really exciting. And I think it's very much in the spirit of Tolstoy College, how this kind of baton of kind of research keeps getting kind of passed on and kind of circulated. Um, so I'm really excited to be here. Um, so a lot of people have said that they found out about Tolstoy College through my article. So I thought I would maybe just say a little bit about how like I found out um, about Tolstoy College. Um, so, and mine um, is, like Chris said, mine is also a syllabus story. <laughs> um, okay, um, so I came to this through Tolstoy, the writer. Um, my PhD is in Russian literature. Um, and I wrote a lot about Tolstoy's political thought for my dissertation. Um, I think there's this idea of Tolstoy particularly in the US that he's like this bourgeois writer of kind of, you know, novels about rich people. Um, but that really could not be further um, from the truth. Um, and particularly in the last like three decades of Tolstoy's life, um, he wrote all these like political essays that called for abolishing the state, um, abolishing private property. Um, he actually renounced the copyright to all of his future work. Um, he was a pacifist. Um, and interestingly enough, this is why he was actually denied the Nobel um, Prize for Literature, which is supposed to be a peace prize. Um, but they said that he had denied the right of nations to self-defense. Um, the Russian government had him under nonstop um, police surveillance and he was excommunicated from the Russian Orthodox Church uh, specifically for his kind of ideas about nonviolence. Um, so, um, you know, he was the most famous living writer at the time. Um, he corresponded with people like Gandhi um, and a lot of radicals and reformers in the United States would send him letters and send him materials. Like one of the things that you would do if you were trying to get a movement off the ground is you would actually write to Tolstoy <laughs> um, and you would ask him if he would be willing to write like a letter on your behalf or if he'd be willing to write the foreword to your manifesto. So he was an incredibly international figure. So that's just to say I wasn't surprised that his ideas would have, you know, kind of eventually made their way to Buffalo. Um, these Tolstoyan communes kind of popped up all around the world in South Africa, in um, sort of Asia, 
these sort of like agrarian anarchist communities um, where people would try to practice the ideas of Tolstoy. So nonviolence for them meant kind of like vegetarianism. <laughs> um, so they were these like kind of like anarchist vegetarian communes that sort of sprouted up um, all over the world, including in the United States, including in upstate New York. Um, so I was putting together um, like a sample syllabus uh, for the job market on Tolstoy and I was looking for um, essays on like some of these essays on these topics. Um, and I just happened to notice that there were a lot of collections that came out in like 1967, 1968, 1969 in English. These kinds of compilations of Tolstoy's essays on nonviolence and civil disobedience. Um, and I just thought, oh, that's interesting, like 1968, like I wonder, <laughs> I wonder, you know, in the midst of the anti-war movement in the United States, like I remember thinking like, I wonder if there maybe had been kind of a resurgence of interest in Tolstoy um, around that time in the late 60s in the midst of the anti-Vietnam War protests. Um, and of course, you know, also that year, 1969, um, Sergei Bondarchuk's adaptation of War and Peace had won the Academy Award for Best Foreign Film for, 19, uh, for, for Russia in 1969. And War and Peace is very much kind of, you know, an anti-war film. Um, so yeah, I guess I was just like wondering like, oh, you know, I wonder if those ideas had been percolating around that time. Like, I wonder if any new Tolstoyan any new Tolstoyans kind of were cropping up in the late 1960s. Um, so um, I really, truly just did a Google, this is Google, I like, this is all thanks to Google. I hate to say it, um, but I just did like a Google book search um, for like Tolstoy Vietnam War. Um, and in the results, um, I found a book by someone named Charles Haney um, that said it was called A Memoir of the New Left. Um, and there was just, which I later learned was just kind of like a, kind of a Charlie Haney who ended up being a really important um, teacher at Tolstoy College. Um, but he had a long history of activism. And, but there was just kind of these passing references to his time at Tolstoy College um, in Buffalo. And I at the time thought, oh, maybe that's like, oh, interesting. Maybe that's like one of these little these little Tolstoy communes maybe popped up in Buffalo um, at that time. And I Googled Tolstoy College Buffalo and I was shocked to find out it wasn't just a little Tolstoy, like Tolstoy commune. This was actually fully ensconced within the State University of New York Buffalo. Um, so that was pretty surprising to me. <laughs> um, and so I, but still like even on the, um, that website where I found out found out about Tolstoy College was the library's website and they just had like a really short paragraph about Tolstoy College and so I really didn't know quite what this was um, except it had something to do with Tolstoy and something to do with kind of anarchism and it was at SUNY um, and um, so at the time I had like a, a postdoc that came with a travel research fund which I always thought I would really use to go somewhere like, like Glamour, like, you know, like a conference in Brazil or something. Um, but I just like had such a straw, I don't know, there was something about this that just really piqued my interest. And I thought there might really be something there. So I booked my flight to Buffalo and booked a few nights in a hotel and um, just was like, you know, I, I'm gonna go to the university archives and see what I can find. Um, and of course, what I found was, you know, just unbelievable. This wasn't just a college where people taught courses on anarchism, taught courses about anarchism, which, you know, a lot of colleges today have classes about anarchism and Marxism and radicalism. Like, that's not, that's not interesting. What was interesting was that it was actually anarchist in the very running of the school. So faculty at faculty meetings, they would talk about, you know, well, what are your household expenses? What are my household expenses? And based on that, they would decide everyone's salary. It's unthinkable <laughs> um, right now. And like in, um, for so many of us who've been in academia, um, you know, students would decide the syllabus. 
Um, students would decide what their grade was going to be. They would argue with each other about like, well, you know, I need this A because I'm going to law school. And then someone else might be like, yeah, but you didn't really contribute. And so everything, literally every aspect of the running of the school was um, collectively decided. Um, and so I just thought this was the most fascinating thing in the whole world. And I wanted people to know about it. Um, and, you know, writing for an academic journal, I knew would take years, which it did. It took three years. Um, but I knew if I could maybe write it for a magazine, it would come out sooner, um, which is, which is what I did. Um, so this, I did the research in 2015, the summer of 2015. It came out in the New York or January 2016. Um, I still, back then, I was still an academic. I've since left academia, but I was an academic then. And what you and I wanted to write a full length, like a very long academic article about Tolstoy. So I was presenting it um, at conferences and things like that. And I presented my research at a conference. Um, actually at Harvard and a bunch of the kind of guys from Tolstoy College came and um, which was so funny these like hippies uh, at this like radical college were here at Harvard um, and so they came and I gave the presentation and there was a Q&A and all of the people who I knew from academia were just talking about this as a kind of like utopian kind of experiment and the guys from Tolstoy College were like wait, I don't, I don't get it though. Like you all are professors. Why can't you all just like get together and plan this and, and do it and execute? Like, you know, they couldn't understand why this seemed so impossible um, to the rest of us. And um, 30 seconds. So, um, you know, I have since left, I, I thought about that exchange for a long time. I was like, why is it so unthinkable? Why can't we just get into a room and do this together? Um, and I have my opinions about why that is, um, and I've shared them a bit with Nick, but I know that he's had better experiences in academia, and I'm really excited to hear about um, what others are thinking about how um, something like this could be possible again or possible in a different kind of permutation. Okay, I'm finished. Hi, sorry, I'm a little bit useless with Zoom. I am Nick. Um, I um, first thanks to everyone for the invitation and preparing this and Jennifer for this introduction to um, Tulsi College and your, and your research. Um, my personal experience in academia, so it's not necessarily like Tolstoy College, although I teach in a business school, um, this business school is grounded in this tradition called critical management studies. Some of you, I'm sure, know it, um, which is, you know, badly speaking, quickly speaking, it's like a broad umbrella term to house a, a very big heterodox family of critical thinking and critical thinkers and practitioners. Um, there, I did a PhD on community organizing, specifically something about visual community organizing. Um, we turned it into a comic. One um, element of that comic for research was this, which I don't know if I can share it, and I don't know how to share it. Doesn't seem to share it. Okay. It's not sharing it, I'll, I'll show it later. Okay, so I'm gonna get started now. Um, part of this um, tradition in the critical management uh, studies is also related to other experiences in the UK, um, like Queen Mary University, which has a critical management studies business school, which used to be run for a while by Stefano Harney, who is a co-author with Fred Moten, you probably heard of them. The whole concept of undercommoning kind of informs this, this experience. And from them, it is that I took this idea that uh, the only possible relationship to the university today is a criminal one. My arrival into a university, however, is um, not criminal. I didn't do any of these illegal things that I'm going to tell you right now about. Some of these things at the time weren't illegal. 
but I need to find a way to share the screen with you. So please bear with me. And if you can stop the timer for a second, because, oh, share screen, here we go. Where are you? Here you are. Share, and now I'm going to put, do you see it? Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. So this is going to be 10 years in 10 minutes from this thing called the really free school to the business school. This talk is very personal. It's a witness narration of things that I've experienced, but it's mixed up in a fictional way with ways in which colleagues and friends also experience this transition to the higher education industrial complex. So in 2010, the Conservative Party in the UK and the Liberal Democrat Coalition came to power. They invented this term, the big society, in order to, uh, this was a slogan with which they tried to impose severe austerity measures to deal with the financial crisis of 2008. Um, these two people that you see here, uh, to the right, is David Cameron, former PM and leader of the Conservative Party. To the left is Sir Nicholas William Peter Clegg, PC. He's the deputy prime minister and he's currently the vice president for global affairs of communications at Facebook. I don't know if he has anything to do with the takedown of FB pages. That's him in the last two days, but probably. So what he did um, as a liberal Democrat, and I don't know why this is going automatically, what he did as a liberal Democrat was to uh, backtrack on a pledge that they were not going to triple tuition fees. They did. Um, and so students rebelled. Um, the outrage of this so-called um, treason went well beyond the constituency that the Liberal Democrats effectively conned into. Um, the first student demonstration was as massive as the anti-war demonstrations from 2003. Uh, even anarchists came out in support of the very fragile and precarious status quo um, at the time. The situation is clearly much worse now. So there was very serious um, um, situations and um, conflict um, in the streets. Some students almost got killed by the police. It was very intense. There were a good number of demonstrations. The first one uh, saw a massive rave at the conservative headquarters. It was occupied by um, students for roughly 10 minutes. The student movement then erupted with occupations uh, across campuses, mass demos with some echoes of past student mobilizations like this one from obviously from 68. Um, this time, the only difference is that social media supported or facilitated a very agile and um, um, astute way of organizing between student occupations in universities all across the country. However, beyond this single issue of higher education and raising tuition fees, there was an emergence of a more expansive understanding of, of the problem. So clearly with higher education in the UK, this is not just about fees, clearly it's class, it's uh, a very racist system and so on. In 2011, in the beginning of 2011, uh, in the heart of London in Bloomsbury, surrounded by university buildings and empty residential commercial properties, built by um, all the criminal trades of empire, uh, a collective in a squad formed the Really Free School. This was to address education issues, but the wider context of austerity and the impositions, neoliberalism, or what the collective used to call that tiny little issue called capitalism. Uh, they planned solidarity actions with the Arab Spring. Um, it was very ambitious. There was a lot of energy and with the concept of the really free school, they tried to re recuperate the term free school back from the conservatives who were trying to use the term free school to um, basically dismantle any state supported education. The method of the really free school was to squat empty mansions, empty buildings, uh, and run uh, education programs open to all but cops and journalists. 
the really free school understood that constant self-education and projects that promote the debate about radical polit politics were necessary at the time and always really. Um, yeah, and they were centered around anarchist practices and um, values, I guess. So the idea was to build this emancipatory horizon um, based on freedom, solidarity, autonomy, self-governance, mutual aid, anti-racism, anti-fascism, anti-patriarchy, and so on. Um, apologies for this weird. You just keep going forward, I don't know why, on the wrong. Um, need to move the page on this. Just a second, please. Okay, so the Really Free School was running um, many, many programs, um, practical, um, like wood carving, uh, sorry, wood, woodwork, carpentry, um, you know, if you wanted to learn about um, electricals, you can, you can do that. There was, there was a, a lot of space for um, many experiences, many practical, uh, many ideas um, and practical uh, programs. I, apologies, I don't know what's going on with the, with the text here. And I cannot move it forward for some reason. Just a second, please. Right. So you you could learn about hacking, plumbing, carpentry, cooking, and so on. Um, the RFS helped build part of the student movement at the very end when uh, finally the tripling of tuition fees uh, went forward. Um, and they, they also supported and gave space for people to, to rest, but also organize. Um, there were literally battles in the streets, like I mentioned, um, a number of people created this thing called the book blog, which you probably heard of, uh, if you want guides on how to build this stuff to protect yourself from cops and other uh, things. And you can find it online at the Victoria and Albert Museum's uh, Disobedient Objects exhibition and the archive. Um, so there was an intensification of everything, austerity, policing. Um, the intensity of policing at the time was um, becoming even worse, 2011. Um, so the a resistance to to, poli to policing a very clear expression of that uh, after the killing of Mark Dargan at the hand of the police. Inevitable tensions, battles against bailiffs, landlords um, created a situation where people burnt out in the really free school. Um, part of the problem was media harassment. Uh, tabloid newspapers went hard on the really free school because the second mansion that they occupied used to belong to Guy Ritchie. They found a way in. The, this is the film director that makes all this East London, you know, working class heroes or criminals um, movies. Um, but yeah, they, they were constantly attacking these people. These were super young uh, organizers who all of a sudden were accused of every single problem here. It's after one week in that house, the eviction, people wanted to protect their identity. So they were all wearing a, a Vinnie Jones uh, face. From the really free school and from this uh, moment in the student movement, the question arose, how do you keep this rebel cosmovision? How do you sustain a space? Well, some members of, of the collective friends and comrades ended up in different projects contributing to um, for instance, Occupy, but the question of impermanence, precarious living, precarious living conditions um, was, was very real. A lot of people entered uh, academy, but also continuing different instances of interventions and direct action. Um, and yeah, within university, it, this is just one way of addressing issues through 
established education, but keeping in mind that education and you know academia, the higher education industrial complex itself is not enough. So we need to keep organizing outside experiences like this, I think are super helpful. So yeah, thank you. I think I overstepped by half a minute. That's great. Thank you for both. Uh, I'll jump in for a, a split second, but I'd like to maybe we have a few minutes to uh, go uh, back and forth a little bit. If there's anything I would love to hear, maybe uh, to start from from Jennifer, actually, if there's anything, Jennifer, that you may want to respond or remark back towards uh, the work of Nicholas, because I think that the, like even with the, the differences in context or, or geographic context, the sort of uh, the prob the um, the educational problem, I guess, uh, emerges in different in different places, and I'm I'm, I'm sort of struck by um, the for both of you the need to um, speak personally about it. I think one of the things of, about the Tolstoy archives for us, uh, and the way that they they come they come to us, and the, the information that are in the syllabi is the importance for personal reflection on these contexts and how these contexts, in fact. Uh, um, they they buoy they 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 literally form the institutions or they form the counter the counter proposals for institutions. So yeah, maybe maybe start about that. You know why why the need for the personal reflection, and also if there's something back and forth between the two of your works that you might want to um, address. Um, yeah, um, I. Well, I don't know. I think on some level, academia invites a lot of self, um, like a lot of reflection. Um, I think you give so much. I, I, I mean, again, I'm speaking from the United States. You give so much of your life. You know, I gave to my PhD and my postdoc, I gave 10 years of my life. So it is in a very significant, you know, really important kind of period of time. So I think it is important to really kind of understand, well, what did I give my life to? And, um, and I think that Tolstoy College asked me some really hard questions um, about that. And I didn't feel like I had good answers. And, um, but I think that uh, hearing um, Nick's presentation, I think that one thing that really strikes me is um, this idea of protest itself as being a form of, of pedagogy, um, you know, uh, because interestingly to me, like, so Charles Plank, who founded Tolstoy College, left pretty soon afterwards. And he, and I asked him, you know, why did you leave? And he said that, um, he said that every day, like, no one would come to class because they were at a protest. <laughs> um, and he just wasn't quite sure what he was doing there anymore. And um, I thought that was an interesting kind of answer. And then obviously, Charlie Haney really took over, who very much saw Protest, going to protests as a really as an important part of pedagogy, just as much as um, just as important as going to class. And so, I guess I was just curious from Nick if he has any thoughts about um, whether students felt that in the act of protesting these fees, they were perhaps learning more than they were even learning in class. Um, many people made that claim, and and I th I'm, I'm pretty sure that everyone experienced this. Um, there is a sense of urgency and there's a lot of practical stuff that you learn in those spaces. Uh, there is a lot of ways of interacting where you cut through, especially in the UK, you cut through the, the whole, you know, performance of, of you know, deference to, to authority. I mean, that comes pretty quickly when cops are, come, you know, trying to bash your head in. So, uh, especially in situations like that where people are, you know, perhaps picketing a university or, or the library or trying to use these spaces for what they you know, were supposedly originally intended to, which is also not true, but it, it's a contested space because it, it's supposed to uphold you know, some kind of, again, a status quo. And in the case of the UK, as you've seen very recently, especially with um, after the, the killing of George Floyd in the US, how it the repercussions here uh, in education spaces, um, especially in Bristol, for instance, with the Coulson statue, these are teaching moments. All of a sudden, you've got people realizing we never learned our history. Mm -hmm. And when we bring it up in a business school, 
it always felt really strange, but all of a sudden there is there is a moment where you can you can take that energy within the class, but also support our own process of of learning outside. So I think a, a lot of us learned a lot in these processes, and I think that this is also why a lot of people uh, engaged in in education at very different levels, even when people are doing I don't know, yeah, childcare or something like that. But I was interested about the whole, um, because when I was in the US, it seemed to me that within academia in the United States, it's, it's pretty violent how you need to act in order to advance your career. Um, I don't know if there is something that you could reflect on that, because it seems to be the case that we are going to yeah. have to intensify things over here as well. Um, so I think that, yeah, one thing that really struck me, kind of the disconnect between how a lot of kind of, you know, activism in the United States around higher ed works versus Tolstoy College is, um, the push, I think a lot of people I know is to push for more tenured positions and Tolstoy College, I think it's really important to remember none of these guys, except for, I think maybe one, none of them were tenured professors. They were basically lecturers, adjuncts. Um, you know, people who, a lot of them are very, did not have a lot of money. Um, and, you know, I think that we have this notion, tenure, the idea of tenure is that it protects you, you can be more outspoken. But anyone who's ever done any organizing on a campus knows the tenured professors are nowhere to be found. <laughs> like it is primarily driven by people who are in very precarious positions. Um, adjuncts, um, graduate students, these are the people really pushing for unionization. Um, and I think that's kind of worth thinking, I think, uh, about when we think about, well, what is it going to take to really transform higher education? Is it about creating kind of more more secure, like kind of more security for a certain group of people? Um, or is it about something a bit more, so, something that I would say bleeds more into society? Because I was thinking, I was like, you know, yeah, the guys from Tolstoy College were really broke, but it was a bit easier to be broke back then, right? Like they did, like healthcare has become just astronomically expensive in the United States. We have fewer social programs. There's just a much scarier kind of, you know, uh, there's a lack of a safety net. Um, so I think that that's also another thing, like really not just organizing within the academia, but also thinking about who's precarious kind of across industries and how to see academics as workers, not just as kind of these rarefied beings who, right, who read Tolstoy. <laughs> For sure. Um... That's uh, super great. I think one of the, the limitations of, of this format is that we will cut everybody short. But one of the, 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 the strengths of the format is that these are all introductions to conversations that are going to extend uh, uh, forward for many months. So I'm going to leave it there and we're going to start to move forward. Hopefully there are some resonances uh, in the next two. But uh, Nicholas, Jennifer, thank you. Uh, and feel free to chime in a little bit later on. Um, I'm going to transition a little bit uh, to our second uh, to uh, presenters, uh, Mike and Camila. Um, uh, the, uh, the loose frame that we had, we had pitched in their direction was that the tensions and the connections between poetry and policy. Um, and uh, I think if I can maybe even speak uh, uh, to, the, uh, to, the, to the structure of this as a space where um, there's a kind of uh, cross-pollination with the idea of Tolstoy in the back of our minds. You know, this thing that is Tolstoy, those of you who are joining us and are like, you actually still don't even know what Tolstoy College is. We still don't actually know. Um, does it, did it exist? Um, uh, does it exist now? Uh, these questions of vest, uh, the vestigial of a thing that came in the past or the, the, the question of the tangential, you know, uh, from Tolstoy College, I think are really present in our minds uh, as a way to frame to, uh, Michael um, who, and Camila, who have both worn very many different hats uh, inside and out of, let's call it education, yeah, maybe, or uh, institutional institutions, 
uh, being creative, being experimental uh, inside and out in an institution. Uh, so I will uh, uh, pass it over uh, to Mike, please, who has, has, has uh, offered nothing but a blank slate to me in order to introduce him. So I thank you for that. Looking forward to hearing from you. Thank you. And I hope everybody is uh, comfortable. Uh, Mike Basinski here, and I'm a former student and lecturer from Tolstoy College, uh, and a former curator, and now simply a poet or a simple poet, uh, with too much to say and too short a time limit. So we have limits wherever we go. One of my fondest memories from the mid 1970s at Tolstoy was meeting Jake Kramer and Henry Pfaff. I believe that was his last name. They were old men and they were real members of the IWW, the Industrial Workers of the World. They were anarcho-syndicalists. Anarcho-syndicalism informs the type of anarchist I have always hoped to be. Syndicalism is a form of union where working people work together without hierarchy, one big union in the spirit of mutual aid. And this is a, an image of what that union is. All right, that's the IWW union. We would be public service right here in the 600s. That is educational workers, uh, that is teachers, the office help, and the janitorial staff, all as one unit. Um, I use this model and its proposals as an ideal with no corrupting hierarchy to impose limits. I just feel a little more spontaneous and a little more creative. And I think anarchism offers an alternative to patriarchal hierarchy uh, power. And I have to make clear that from my point of view that to bring others in to share in the apple pie of power isn't an end point. There must be a completely different pie cherry or pineapple or shaped like a fire or fire hydrant or a spoon or something amorphous. The anarcho-syndicalist impulse is for me an alternative. Enough, I'm here to offer some comments on archives and on poetry. Any of you interested in archism, anarchism should uh, seek the I think, or make a contact with the anarchist Labade collection at the University of Michigan, where uh, Julie Harada is curator. She's an old colleague whom I met at an underground zine conference in the early 1990s in Chicago. Uh, she should know all about what you are doing. Uh, so what is a poetry cur curator from the University at Buffalo and his steam library doing an underground zine conference. Let me say that archives are collections of material that offer facts, but not only the facts that are allowed, but only the facts that are allowed in or sneak in. Some dilemmas which impose limits are institutional purpose and agenda and tradition and collecting policy and most problematic budget which buys and processes material, pays processing, archivists, sets processing schedules, and therefore access to collections, and pays the electric bills. And one of the uh, most important aspects, provides shelter and safety for collections. Without space, you can't collect. Tolstoy College passed into history more than 35 years ago, and the collection had to sit and wait for you, and this is not a particularly long time. Today, institutions are looking to cut libraries, archive staff, and they don't want to build more buildings, particularly buildings that are warehouses, which fill quickly with collections in waiting. Keeping the door has, doors open is an uphill battle in whatever institution with only processors, curators, librarians, and archivists as frontline defense. These individuals record and organize everything that is in a collection, but they work under hierarchical limits and constraints and backlogs that are really decades long. When I left the collection, we had a 17 year backlog. I have no great faith that waiting collections, collections in wait, waiting collections will remain forever. Weeding, a term used by administration 
to erase collections is a reality. Collections in storage could very well be waiting for the next truck to the landfill. I would say good researchers, do it now because use is equal to value, is equal to longevity. Support archives everywhere. They are a functioning socialist institution in our society. And I suggest you build a personal relationship with whatever archive you wish and support it. You all have to build it. Hierarchical imposition, impos, imposition suggests that research is limited to providing a thesis or simply defining a moment in time. I say engage in creative research and reading, which is the most exhilarating intimate educational experience possible. When you engage a collection, read everything and look for connections, links, and follow them. An archive is a web, a network that expands beyond the immediate box in front of you. Don't be limited uh, by the quest for an end product. As a person who spent his entire dot life working in the intimate sheer delight of papers and letters and books and archival stuff, I fortunately had a wonderful collection pile, collecting policy. The policy of the poetry collection is to collect all Anglophone poetry publications of the 20th century and now 21st around the world. Uh, the initial impulse, the initial idea was to create a bibliographer, a bibliographer's paradise. And paradise is an important word, as is the word all. All the sacred and all the profane. A collecting policy has to offer limitless collecting creativity. That's why I was, a zine, that's why I was at a zine conference in Chicago seeking ephemeral unsanctioned poetry. Poetry, the realm of the poem, is filled with limits and conventions and scooby snacks for all those who obey. There is a centrist sanctioned contemporary personal philosophical form of poetry that is offered as a template to, uh, to what do they do, to measure to measure the poet's success. 90% of the poetry follows this form. The poet is rewarded for adhering to convention, for navigating in the tiny waiting pool of poetry. There is a poetry to one side of this center that introduces various sociology, social class, race, gender, age, blunt language patterns, and frank visions. There is a poetry on another side that perceives itself as a high art academic poetry. And then there are various little poetries on other sides, visual poetry and conceptual poetry and a semic poetry. Of course, this is a simple Mac, but I suggest that all of these poetries, which I read and enjoy, and you can see it all over here someplace, uh, remain in the comfort of their conventions, which we accept along with the brilliance and intellectual prowess and acrobatics and sociological realities of poet authority. In poetry, conventions involve beginning at the top of the page, being confined to the page, poems being black and white pages, comprised of various standard fonts that move the eyes from right to left with no indication of the hand and poems containing only sanctioned words composed of sanctioned letters and poems that demand a predetermined reading convention. My response as a poet who adheres to anarcho-syndicalism was a wondering of how I might extend beyond the conventions, knowing that they are a facet of me, that I am a puppet of poetry structure and that I desperately want poetry treats. So I imagined a type of syndicalist poem that I call an OPEM, O-P-E-M, which at first was a typo. I thought that was a good place to start. The OPEM, the OPEM invites all forms of poetry to be part, mean, meaning, to be part of it, meaning rhymes, sonnets, image, visual work, abstract constructions, narratives, confessional, performative, sound, instructional, understandability, and with no understandability, incorporating snippets of real pictures and my hand and color, et cetera, et cetera. 
and then how to read. Most pawns want you to read them as they are manifested. They are like a recording, reframe, reframe. I suggest an improbable, an improvisational recitation with no particular notion of this is the right way, the right meaning, with no start here in one place and no end in another, with a release of immediate imagination, with a variable duration, always in evolution and flux, with instantaneous neologism, sound ringing, reading, crying, screaming, inventing letters and symbols, and translation of such, and all other language patterns in one big union of poetry. And this is kind of what I've been doing then. They're sort of like this. You see, there are these creatures that exist on these sheets of paper. I'm moving too fast. There are, there's a little ghost in my finger and some Islamic writing and there's a little vowel animal crawling across the page. And there are some symbols and more vowel animals. They're all different sizes. The biggest I've made is four, six by, four feet by six feet. Here's a little bigger one. And you can see here's an E that isn't an E, an E that isn't an E, and a symbol for an improvisation. This is my own made up extra letter of the alphabet. I thought the alphabet had too, too few letters. So I uh, decided to invent some of my own letters in their meetings, and this is one of them, my great improvisational dot. So when I look at that, I can say anything that is in my particular mind at any particular time, so you have immediate reading of the poem. And here is someone pondering what is going on, and my thumb and a tongue and a thumb and a tongue and a thumb and a tongue and some A's and a butterfly. Thumb and a tongue and a thumb and a tongue and a butterfly and another butterfly, mm, and a yes and everybody knows that the Yeti is the totem animal of these particular poems. And Yeti sometimes squeal. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. That was amazing. Um, I'm going to hand it over to Camila now, uh, and then I'll, you'll hear from me again. Uh, in a minute. Thank you. Please go ahead. How, how do I follow that? Um, hi, everyone. I'm really excited to speak with you guys. Um, I usually start off every talk that I give uh, talking about how I feel like my brain is more like a bowl than a sieve, which often means that uh, I have really poor sensory gating. So a lot of information collects in my head. And these public talks are my only sort of way to sort of shake them out. So I'm appreciative. Uh, of everyone <laughs> uh, being here so I can have sort of a space to shake some things out um, of my brain um, as my snaps are firing, as everyone else is speaking and just thinking about a lot of ideas. Before I jump into what I wanted to talk about with regards to poetry and policy, I first wanted to uh, just uh, mention a couple of things that connected for me as everyone was speaking. Uh, the first thing was really beautiful hearing about every, how everyone sort of came to understand and uh, sort of find this archive on to a sort of college. Uh, it reminded me a lot of Octavia uh, Stell Butler's notion of primitive hypertext, or the sort of process of arriving at something without intending to be there and sort of laterally reading across many different texts, the sort of, and, and waiting for this sort of cross pollination. So it made me really excited to know and uh, learn a bit more about this process of like looking for something but not knowing exactly what you're going to find, but sort of allowing yourself to wander um, I'm thinking about the intuitive as still being intentional and thinking about learning as something that's about wandering versus arriving at a destination. Um, and someone else had mentioned something around the vestigial and tangential and I, uh, maybe this is why my brain is like a bowl and not a sieve. I kind of feel like nothing is tangential and nothing is vestigial. Everything is, uh, has relevance. Um, and so thinking about learning that's not driven by capitalism, where um, anyone can pursue any sort of line of thinking because there's no imperative to arrive at a particular place at a particular time. And so sort of pursuing this notion of learning being more about being generative rather than productive. And if we sort of surrender to uh, the interest in being generative, which doesn't require producing a lot, but requires just being in the sort of ethos and focus of trying to build networks and ecosystems. Um, so with all that, my name is Kmila. Uh, I identify as a learner, um, meaning that even though I make art objects, 
uh, I think about myself as a learner who makes um, my research and thinking visible, not necessarily legible, through a lot of different uh, projects, sometimes it's an installation, sometimes it's public art, sometimes an essay, sometimes it's a publication. Um, but my real interest is in thinking about how I think alongside others and sort of these poetics of revision that allow me to uh, be in, in perpetual learning with other people. Um, I came to understand about this lovely college uh, when I was invited to uh, one of the subway um, with all the lovely people here at Collective Question to sort of think about a lot of ideas. Um, and that sparked a lot of interest in, for me because I started thinking about the sort of like the legacy that I have with experimental schools and education. Um, I grew up in Northern California in a small town called East Palo Alto. Uh, and that town um, basically created its own school system, K through 14, uh, included co uh, two-year college, uh, K through 12, and it was run based by people in the community in like bedrooms, or not bedrooms, rather, but homes, porches, corners, churches, anywhere that there was space. Um, and was part of that consortium of colleges in the 60s and 70s. Uh, where there was a large focus on how do you actually build something within communities and by communities with a focus on learning that is sort of removed from institutions um, where the goal may have been around standardized education or standardization in any other context. Um, I also recently found out my mom went to third college uh, along with my dad at UCSD, um, whose history I didn't know much about uh, until like literally a day ago, uh, <laughs> which was also a school that was sort of focused on how do I reorganize the UC curriculum to be more focused on organizing and more focused on studying self and studying theory and history. Um, and then I guess as another piece of context, I used to be a high school history teacher. Um, in 2013, I left that work and now work um, doing curriculum development for high school social studies in New York City, which is uh, quite an interesting job. Uh, and as we get into more things around policy and, and, and poetry, um, thinking about the policy imposed by state standards and sort of uh, my role in that process. So in learning more about Tulsa College, uh, one of the questions that surfaced a lot for me is thinking about uh, the university as a container for anarchist practices and anarchist uh, sort of experimentation uh, and thinking about anarchy um, and this sort of this politics, this sort of dispersed politics um, as something that uh, interrogates the idea of a container, uh, the container of the university, the container of the state, the container of any structure where the blue itself is fascism. Right. And so uh, a couple of questions that surfaced for me was sort of thinking about uh, what does it mean to be a college within another college uh, and what does it mean to be absorbed by that which contains it rather than being absorbed by that which exceeds it. Um, so how do you become part of an institution which holds values that are different from yours uh, without being absorbed by those values, um, whether implicitly or explicitly. Um, and I know Jennifer is going to be here, so this is super cool. I feel like I'm like, looking at celebrities here. Um, after I read the article, <laughs> I was super excited because one of the questions that was mentioned was um, the question from Peter, or the statement from Peter Murphy where he says, if the state wants to fund its demise, uh, that's great. And I was really excited about this question about whether or not the state funds its own demise. So much of what I'll be talking about in the five minutes I was just notified of uh, are sort of uh, Tupperware uh, and the idea of containers and excess. Um, and before I get there, I just wanted to mention sort of like the dangers of trying to create or craft comparisons, which is about building narratives between things. Um, and so when we say something's in relationship to something else, what we're really saying is that the thing that I observe with my limited perceptual capacity is related to this other thing that I've observed with my limited perceptual capacity. So we do a lot of flattening in the service of comprehension, uh, but I still want to talk about this relationship between policy and poetry. Um, at a talk, uh, that I gave at EFLUX uh, earlier this year, there was another speaker who happened to go right before me, um, and I was speaking about analogy and how it's a sloppy menace. Her name is Martha Kinney, um, and she talked about this idea of speculative comparison, where the goal is not to create definitive ontological relationships, but the goal is to actually think about relationships as agile and absolutely open to possibility. And so what I'm going to try to do now is to run through 12 comparisons that I made between policy and poetry as quickly as possible. So the first note is here that all of us know examples of, po of poetry, but we don't know poetry. And all of us know examples of policy, but we don't know policy. Uh, Wikipedia tells us that policy is a deliberate system of principles to guide decisions towards rational outcomes. It is intent and it's around procedure and protocol, and it does not compel you. Uh, policy is different from a law because a policy 
uh, simply suggests these things while law compels certain behavior. And Wikipedia also tells us that poetry is thinking about the use of aesthetic language towards uh, evoking meaning um, and to some extent evoking a particular emotion. So keeping speculative comparison and analogy as a sloppy menace in the back of my mind, here are a couple of the ways that I saw some relationships. Um, I think about policy and poetry are both containers and they have specific affordances or possibilities. Policy can only reach so far, poetry can only do so much, and those parameters and those affordances are created both by the limitations of our imagination and logistical concerns. Everything can't be policy and everything cannot be poetry. Um, both policy and function, number two, uh, function at the level of suggestion. They present a rhetorical context that suggests action but don't necessarily impose. So number three, as such, they're pedagogical, they're instructive, but again, with any pedagogical approach, uh, the person who's in receiving it doesn't actually have to respond to it in the way that the author has desired it. Um, policy suggests the protocol for completing a task or meeting a goal. A policy around how you should enter a building, a policy around what happens to report a grievance. It's a protocol. If you don't follow it, it doesn't necessarily mean that you're penalized. It just means that it may not be rendered legible. Poetry suggests a protocol for reading. So if you think about enjambment, for example, which is basically a sentence that continues without um, sort of like punctuation to say it's the end, uh, that sort of poetic device suggests the velocity or speed or speaking direction for reading, right? So, so poetry suggests the protocol for reading. Uh, number six, poetry and um, policy create their own epistemological universe and internal vernacular. So a policy may use words in ways that are not used outside of that policy. And likewise, a poem will construct its own self-reflexive self dictionary and vernacular. Um, a word defined by words within the poem may only mean that in the context of the poem, but possibly nowhere else. And even though, number seven, they create their own universes, both poems and policies, because their language exists in other universes, other ecosystems, and other intertextual relationships uh, with other poems and with other policies. Uh, number eight, poems and policies can function as invasive species within assumed categories of poetry and policy. Um, so I think to Michael's point before around conventions and rules, uh, the notion that a particular poem that breaks uh, structure or breaks uh, convention sort of can function as an invasive species within a, an assumed category of what is a poem, a policy that's written in a particular way can sort of be invasive in that context. Um, and thinking about invasive not in the colonial context, uh, in the biological context, um, where these things are rendered uh, a detriment necessary, but thinking about this invasion as a generative operation. I have one minute to do nine, 10, and 11, and we're gonna get through all of them. Number nine, <laughs> policy, even though most open poems, uh, a policy and even uh, the most open poems have a desired outcome. Policy seeks the execution of an act towards a certain feature. Do this, we can arrive here. And poems seek comprehension, exuberant self-discovery, or even co-construction. Um, and even a poet that tells you, oh no, I don't care about that, still cares about people arriving somewhere, uh, even if it's the somewhere is nowhere. Uh, number 10, both policy and poetry are open to interpretation, um, which partially undoes everything that I said, which I'm completely fine with. Policy and poetry being open to interpretation mean that two people can look at the same policy and behave in completely different ways, and two people can read the same poem and arrive at different interpretations, um, which pull, calls into question this uh, idea around uh, being compelled or gesturing towards a certain um, location. And then finally, um, both policy and poetry, while being containers, are exceeded by forms and language that don't fit neatly into the category of policy or poetry. So a poetic gesture, not necessarily a poem, uh, but a thing gesturing to a poem, hyperlocal policies, such as the policy that a teacher like myself might have uh, in the classroom, but not a school-wide policy. So there are considerations around scale and dispersal when it comes to these comparisons. I think I literally met those 10 minutes, so I'm gonna stop talking. Thank you. <laughs> Wow, perfect timing. Thank you. Um, both of you, that was uh, incredible. I, I couldn't keep up with my notes. I'm, I'm sh sure just as everyone else swimming with ideas and uh, feeling all these resonances and, uh, and uh, you've triggered all these tangents. Um, and yeah, I just, it feels like a sort of generative thing. So I hope <laughs> Jill, Jill has notes. Thank you. So I, I hope. Um, uh, well, actually, I had I had prepared some questions, but I wanted to sort of uh, first uh, ask if there were there's anything that either of you wanted to uh, 
to you to respond to each other uh, in the immediate sense, and then I could uh, come in with something if, if necessary. Um, and then I'll just also say, uh, following that, we're gonna open it up to a, a, an open general Q&A. Um, but let's start with, uh, if uh, Mikey just unmuted, so maybe you wanna start. I, I just like the, I, I, I like the idea of, uh, of an invasive species poem, yes. That's it. Yeah, I, I guess I can um, respond. Uh, Michael, as you were speaking, I, I, the thing that resonated, not that nothing else resonated, but the thing that kept resonating were the, were the Scooby Snacks um, and, and sort of this moving back and forth between um, I want to break form, but I also want the Scooby Snacks, um, which kind of reminds me of the way that we form institutions. While, like we want to be accepted uh, within the existing ecosystem of institutions. We want to be recognized as a college, we want to be recognized as a professor, we want to be recognized, while at the same time, we don't want to conform to those particular uh, conventions. So I, I, I think, I, I always remember Scooby Snacks in this context, <laughs> yeah. of sort of thinking about how you balance um, building your own ecosystem of like institutions, people, ideas, um, while it's still that like pain in your heart where it's like, yeah, but I still want you guys to recognize me as the thing that I'm trying to be, but also separate from you, because I think that what you're doing is not what I want to do. Well, I, I think I think at Tolstoy again, it come it came back to making sure you knew who you were and why you were doing things. So it's kind of self-realization that, of course, you are you 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 want to break form, but by that you're making form, and uh, I, I <laughs> it's just that endless contradiction of being human and trying to manifest an ideology, you know, that is an ideal. And I think that's a, that's a tension always in anarchist uh, circles. Um, and it's sometimes why co-ops and collective living fails is because we don't recognize our humanness enough and we're seeking only the ideal without paying attention to the self. So it's always that kind of line. Um, and, and, just, I'm, 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 and I'm satisfied with that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, can, I, I, I understand. I under, at this stage, you know, took I a while. I just want to make a plug for invasive species. A friend of mine, she didn't tell me to do this, I promise. A friend of mine wrote a collection of poetry called Invasive Species, which is about um, the relationship between the language of invasive species and immigration. Um, so yeah, her name is Mara Halal. Terrific. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I, I wanted to, I, I mean, this being sort of the, the prompt that we throw you being about poetry and policy and just sort of like speaking from my entry point to the Tulsa College thing. Um, you know, like, I've, yeah, I don't know if this is sort of a, a dangerous uh, comparison, but, um, you know, because Camila, you work in um, uh, social studies policy uh, uh, curriculum development for New York City, and Michael, because you know you 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 taught at Tulsa College, but and you know for a number of years, but also worked as the sort of curator. And I'm glad that you spoke about the sort of like archival, um, you know, the, the sort of the policy dimension of archives. Um, I, I don't know. Maybe this is a simple question or, or a, a dumb question, but I was wondering if you could spec speculate a little bit about you know, what it might mean to replace policy with poetry, right? So like, hopefully this triggers something, but like, what would a poetic budget be? And I'm also sort of want to pick up on, on the reference that uh, Camila made to Octavia Butler and the sort of notion of primitive hypertext and sort of like the, the sort of non-linear trajectory that, that a poetic curriculum might uh, uh, suggest or open up, right? Like what, what you know, what, how could that, you know, can you do that in, 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 in your, at your job? Like, did you find that you were able to do that at, at, at UB as a, you know, as a sort of more embedded uh, archivist and, and librarian, Michael? Mm -hmm. uh, yes, how's that? Uh, <laughs> I think you carry your politics with you and you exercise them when you can. So, I mean, if you've got a liberal, uh, an expansive collecting policy, does not mean the individual is going to act upon it. So where, whatever you are given, uh, if you can stretch your, if you can stretch that and, and, and take your politics and your images of the way you wish to live and exist into it, I think you can. 
And of course, you know, I mean, yeah, again, it's sort of like, I, mean, I, I spent 45 years on the campus. So, I mean, it's a survival technique and it's a survival technique as an invasive species I just took over. So, I mean, you might say that, you know, uh, but uh, yeah, I think you can. And I don't think that I, 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 I just don't think you give, um, you don't seek a, a, a form of preciousness or a, a, a form of, um, you, you, you don't advertise it, you just, you just do it. And if you have a certain amount of uh, given space, that you can manipulate around in this space, much the same as as Liz Park is manipulating uh, uh, the space in which she, she exists. I don't know if Bob Scalise is still here or not. Uh, I don't know, but, but nevertheless, uh, you, I was doing similar things in my fashion, the way Liz has organized this with all of you. And you know you can go. It's it's quite fun to go to these meetings and to push and pull in one sense. Uh, so it's part of the game. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a. But but you know it, I would always go in w w with the notion of that this is this is humorous rather than serious, and I think that also helps too. Maybe it's my own quirky personality, which I'll accept. <laughs> Chris, I, I really like your question, which is, uh, can I do any of the things that I talked about in my day job? Um, and the first answer is no. Um, and I don't like to be like the silver lining of COVID-19 and blah, 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 because people are literally dying. Uh, but one thing that did happen with an educational lease in New York State was that the regions were canceled uh, in June. And they were also canceled in August. And we're all going to keep our fingers crossed they're canceled for eternity. Uh, because the regions uh, functions as a policy uh, that imposes particular structures on the way that students learn and what they can learn. And so what did happen uh, this past semester is that a lot of students um, who uh, were sort of forced into like the nature of like learning through for the regions ended up uh, in a place um, where they weren't taking the regions so their teachers could actually do what they wanted. And so we saw so many beautiful things happen where teachers decided to do projects where kids created their own primary sources about COVID. We saw kids analyzing speeches. I worked with some teachers around how to build out these, these projects, which are really rooted in like kids identifying an area of interest um, for themselves and working. And so I do think that there is space for curriculum to be poetic and to engage with poetry if this sort of overarching policy of standardized testing uh, is removed because that thing dictates everything. Uh, when I was a classroom teacher, I taught in California before I came to New York. California does not have the same uh, regime around testing. And I remember coming to New York and being like, what? We have to learn this for what? Because the test is asked, what is this? Whereas in California, I just remember being like, this is stuff we're gonna spend a little bit longer here because you guys seem super interested. And my goal was for you guys to A, learn the skills you need to learn, but also to be interested in coming to school and to build relationships with one another. Uh, so I do think there's space. And I, I think that, um, yeah, I'm excited about the, the, the opening of schools is, is going to be horrific. And also I'm excited about what spaces are open uh, for teachers who have the capacity to think about this because the reality also is that because of the other interlinking uh, policies that exist around returning to school, et cetera, et cetera. Some people literally won't have the capacity to think beyond uh, the poetics of what has already been given to them, which is teach towards the exam. Yeah, thank you. Um, uh, I, I, I wanna sort of like, um, um, thank you both for the, the thoughts and the contributions. Um, I just wanna sort of bracket this uh, part and transition to uh, an open Q&A, but I just wanna share um, also in the sort of spirit of, you know, destabilizing uh, conventional forms of citation and valorization of, you know, knowledge. I just wanna read a tweet for you where someone uh, meant, says something uh, overheard, uh, uh, that they, they overheard Gayatri Spivak saying, which is, and the tweet reads, I once heard Gayatri Spivak describe an academic field as a field of vision. It's about who and what you train yourself to see, 
um, look for and listen to, who you, who you listen to, you know, this is the, the profound one for me. So the field is not an object or terrain that one masters, but a mode of seeking in the world that one cultivates endlessly. Um, and this is, uh, you know, I think something that, that I think, uh, you know, informed in, a, in, a, in a, another language, perhaps another sort of uh, ecology, what Tolstoy is doing, but I think is something that uh, all of you uh, have touched on uh, in different ways. And so I want to uh, just, again, bracket this by thanking you all uh, for that uh, um, and open it up to questions. I think I'm going to get a feed of questions or uh, how, how's it going to go, if there have been any. Or if there are questions now, you can type them into the general chat. Oh, there haven't been any. If uh, we weren't going for a drink, where would we go? Oh, <laughs> well, <laughs> You know, one of the reasons that I moved to Buffalo is because I love chicken wings. Honestly. Okay. <laughs> Honestly. That's fair. That's so fair. We would go. We would go to uh, Anchor Bar. But here, disputed right, history. We're just right? breaking the ice here, so this let's be, be free to talk. You know. We can go on this tangent. I can talk about chicken wings. <laughs> uh, but there is a disputed history about the origin. You know. Um, if you if you want to just jump in and and un unmute yourself, can can people do that? Is the is that functionality allowed? If you want to just unmute yourself and ask something, you can jump in as well. I see that um, Olive has unmuted themselves. Or did I misread that? Sorry, I'm doing my like teacher mode and just calling on people now. <laughs> We do have one from Liz. Oh, Liz, please go ahead. Is Liz there? Liz is here. here. This hi, is Liz. sort of a bit, hi. This is sort of a vague question, but um, I'm hoping it can be more like a topic of conversation than a question. Um, what do you think about the influence of pedagogical architecture? as in um, Tolstoy College's trailers versus the virtual classroom versus the beautiful and well-appointed classrooms of Ivy League colleges versus UB's um, maybe less, somewhat less well-appointed classrooms. Um, just, a, just a feeling about what you think, what influence you think those, the spaces have on learning and pedagogy. I mean, I'm happy to riff on this if uh, no one else wants to take a go. Um, so, yeah, I, it's a good question, but I think that I can just speak, I guess, from my specific experience mulling the archives um, and kind of what occurred to me during that were um, these ideas that got very specific at times about the pink trailers and Michael, maybe you can fill in some of these gaps because a lot of sure. the, the memories or the memory that I have from just the archive are some of the, the descriptions of the Ellicott campus, the pink trailer, and these ideas of taking, you know, the classroom into, uh, you know, the, um, the outdoor space. So, I honestly think Michael might might be able to speak to this from experience rather than, you know, archival findings. So, by all means. Well, we had uh, there were trailers, and Tolstoy had a trailer, which was two big rooms, restroom, and several little offices, as I recall. And uh, after that. We had a house on Winspear Avenue. The university used to have houses. When it was expanding very quickly, it bought residences along Winspear Avenue. It was American Studies and Women's Studies. And Tolstoy had its own house. And after that, uh, into Townsend Hall, which was an academic, an old academic building. Um, and I think 
these, while there was institutional furniture, for instance, in these, there were, there were also old couches and people would bring in, you know, old chairs and we had the opportunity to decorate and keep books around that uh, people thought were significant and to post slingers and posters uh, that advertised aspects of uh, various communities coming into interaction with each other in, the, in these spaces. So it was a protective space uh, rather than a, a public classroom where half a dozen different classes would come in and out through the course of a day and it could be could be English, geology, math, et cetera, et cetera. And these are designated spaces. So it became, what, should, should I say, like home, or you felt comfortable doing things in this space, um, leaving your own texts there to be read and sharing them. And it, it also allowed you to um, not adhere again to this rigidness of like the uh, 54 minute hour and then the bell rings and you move off someplace else. So these, these classes could go on and on and on. And this notion of limits uh, were by that fact dispensed. So owning your own space or having your own space created those opportunities. Does that make, is that a form of answer at least? And this is, this is, this is, these are again, you know, pleasant memories. Yeah, I like that answer. Can I add, uh, go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. I would just also like to kind of add in terms of like the virtual cat um classroom aspect of that question. This kind of goes back into the idea of like spatializing education almost. So like designating which spaces are used as active sectors of learning as well. So like a church, um, a church that sanctuary could be just seen as a church sanctuary until you start maybe teaching readings or teaching hymns and scriptures and it becomes the center of learning and the actual um, purpose of the space has been changed. So I think that also ties a lot into like pedagogical architectures in which spaces are kind of imbued with meanings before any actual learning takes place. So I think that that's something super special about Tolstoy is that they took spaces that may not have been as opportune for centers of learning and they turned them into active spaces where not only learning could happen, but then further, um, I guess, reasoning and kind of questions being asked of what education is itself. And I think that kind of ties back into virtual classrooms today with kids kind of asking, okay, I'm at home. I may be in my PJs, but am I still learning in this space? And do I still have the same connection to the materials and to my classmates learning in this space as if I was in a classroom? And I think Tolstoy kind of addressed that very well. And, and as I said, I just I have to also mention that women's studies had their own uh, house, as did uh, American studies for a while. And some of these other college units also had uh, trailers in the trailer complex. complex. So, and Camila and then Jennifer wanted to jump in. Yeah, I'll, I'll be quick. Um, there are a couple of things. Thank you, Liz, for that question uh, that came up for me around uh, architecture. Uh, the first is uh, I grew up in East Palo Alto, as I noted, which is a poor town, still is. Um, and I went to a Catholic school for um, for high school. Um, and part of that movement of my body from my community to another community for what was considered to be superior education also meant that you associate certain environments and certain people uh, with holding valuable knowledge. And so for me, I'm really interested in thinking about learning that can happen close to home for young people in particular, um, because it uh, sort of shifts sort of who is, who is given epistemological um, authority when when any space or any body or anything that could be something from which to learn um is sort of like prioritized within the scope of learning so i i've been thinking a lot about like what does it mean that um when desegregation happened the notion was that you have to go somewhere else to learn because you can't learn here because this space is not a space where learning happens because it's not good enough um, or the notion that to go and learn more about what we're talking you need to go far away to college and so thinking about how the communities that, in particular, because I work most with high school students and some grad students, 
uh, those communities themselves can be like. Uh, I really like, Jill, I really like this language around active sectors of learning. Um, I think that's like really beautiful language. Um, so there's that that I got really excited about and thought about Nairobi College back home and the ways in which every space was sort of activated, a church, a corner, everything was a learning space. Um, and it also got me thinking about interspecies learning. Uh, anyone who ever wants to talk about interspecies anything, uh, please hit me up. Uh, but there's this really exciting thing for me around this prioritization of humans as the only organisms uh, from which uh, that can produce knowledge and receive knowledge, right? And there is much learning that can be had between myself and a plant. I learn a lot from my plants. So there's much learning that a plant learns from my interaction as well. And so thinking about this idea of active sectors of learning, also think about um, active relationality, uh, where it's not human to human learning, but what does it mean to learn from the anti-surveillance techniques of like a hawk moth that vibrates its genitalia in order to interrupt the bat echolocation, right? That is something to be learned. Um, or these other organisms that are able to engage in anti-surveillance uh, activities. And that's something to be learned, right? So I think um, the question of architecture um, is also a question of what Jill said around spatializing, um, but also spatializing the species with which we're engaging in learning. Um, that's amazing. I kind of like following up on that a little bit, this idea of you know, why have we decided as a culture, particularly in the US that educate for higher education that you have to like leave home and go away. And I think um, to bring it back to Tolstoy himself, he actually refused to participate in any of these Tolstoyan communes because he said, no, the goal is not to create a separate space for these ideas, but to make sure they're constantly kind of intermingling with kind of your everyday life, your normal life. Um, one point I would say about, you know, virtual, the virtual classroom. So I, so I occasionally will like adjunct teach a class here and there. And I, in spring, I was teaching a class at Barnard College, which is a school that has, you know, a lot of money. They have a really strong financial aid program. So a lot of people from very different socioeconomic backgrounds come to class and everyone's sort of equalized, right? Um, they all stay in the same dorms. When we switch to virtual, um, and so I had no idea who was, who came from money, who, you know, who was, who didn't. When we switched to virtual, that came very much into kind of stark relief. Um, it was very clear. Uh, people would say, oh, I'm Skyping, you know, I'm zooming in from my parents' summer home on the lake versus I, I had another student who couldn't turn the sound on because there were so many people in her living environment um, you know, so many people sharing rooms and sharing space that she couldn't really participate in class. And, you know, I read this article that was like, one of the terrible things about, about the pandemic is that it's disrupted this um, system where everyone comes to campus and is kind of equalized. And I remember thinking like, well, why, why the, the, that's fake. <laughs> like that's the, that, that's bogus. I'd rather us like fully confront the difference, the different kind of resources that we come to this classroom kind of with. And so I do, I do kind of think that these different spaces can reflect and can uh, change like the educational experience. Thank you. Um, there's a question from, oh, I don't know it's from, but the question is, uh, is there any overlap with Black Mountain to Black Mountain College and Tolstoy? Uh, maybe Michael, I, Michael, you know, I, I think there was, but <laughs> you can confirm maybe. Black Mountain too was another college. Mm -hmm. And I think it evolved out of, uh, a college that was doing arts and crafts, and it was a later manifestation. So it wasn't as wasn't one of the early uh, uh, one of the early colleges. And because UB at that point uh, inherited lots of faculty from Black Mountain, or or Black Mountaineers were often visitors to the campus. Uh, it thought it was uh, it was thought that why not have Black Mountain too also now I think Black Mountain too was strictly um, in the Ellicott complex and we should remember that the Ellicott complex was once imagined to be the home of all of these camp uh, all of these various colleges and there and that Tolstoy would in fact that had it evolved would have been a residential college where students would actually have uh, lived in. Tolstoy College as part of the university system. So Black Mountain was, was a little later on, mm -hmm. um, if that's an answer. Mm -hmm. 
Thank you. Um, uh, I, I think we're about at time, so, but I just wanted to ask um, if there are any other uh, alums from Tolstoy present, um, if you could, if you, if you were uh, open to sharing that your presence with us. <gasps> Out of curiosity. Maybe not. We're old people. We're old people now. It's almost time for bed. <laughs> That's true. Um, well, maybe uh, you know we, we've we've uh, uh, shared a lot of time together today, and uh, uh, I've certainly gotten a lot out of it and feel energized by by everything. So, um, uh, and it is getting to about dinner time. Um, so maybe maybe we'll uh, conclude it there. Um, oh no, we we wanted to do a, a, a sort of like last word, didn't we? Um, maybe just sort of like a last uh, uh, couple couple words from from everyone, and we can go in order uh, of uh, the presenters today. So I think we started with Jennifer today, didn't we? And then Nick. Yeah, just maybe the thought. So just like a last note on this kind of. Um, exchange that Camila and I just had about like the importance of doing this kind of education work in a way that doesn't feel separate all right like that, that we don't move this to some sort of kind of some sort of different space and because I think one thing that's really important to remember about the history of the colleges particularly from the perspective of the administration and the university was that this was specifically a tactic from Martin Meyerson at Berkeley um, who came to SUNY Buffalo from Berkeley to make sure that the radical elements of the student population were somewhat segregated and that were kind of in their own kind of like right on the separate campus um, and that it would kind of make sure that these ideas weren't intermingling too closely with the main student body and so I think that's something to just keep in mind when we're thinking about how to set up these spaces like how do we set them up in a way that's intentional but um, but also um, kind of integrated. That's all. Nick, would you like to go? Yeah, yeah, just about spaces of, for, of education. I just, um, an organization, I remember um, learning, for instance, that in, in Johannesburg, after the Soweto massacre, that churches be, became spaces for uh, organizing resistance against apartheid. So any space can can be turned into a teaching space or learning space. In fact, if you think about anarchist education, uh, factories. You know, if, if you think about women working in factories, you know they had to bring their kids in, so they would organize shifts. To, you know, de to deal with the education of the children or even self education. Uh, there would always be, in some cases not always, sorry, in some cases, there would be someone who, for instance, steps back and opens up, I don't know, Capital Volume 1 and starts reading to fellow workers, provided, you know, the factory is not too loud, I guess. But there are, there are histories of finding always ways for, for self-education and learning um, about your own conditions, uh, your own material conditions, how you're being exploited, for instance, and so on. Um, that's my contribution, my thought about spaces. But yeah, thank you very much to everyone for your patience with the, all the technical stuff that I, and the accent that I subjected you to. <laughs> it's beautiful. Um, thank you, Nick. Uh, Michael? Thanks. And uh, I feel less cynical after uh, hearing all of you and uh, seeing you, all of you so engaged. One thing I didn't mention because of time is when I did meet Jake Kramer, he was a member of the IWW, but he was also a, uh, a person that was organizing a group called the Gray Panthers for senior citizens to uh, uh, mobilize. And um, I very much see a continuum here, sort of 
myself now being as old as he was and seeing you all responding to those same philosophies, that it is a continuum. And uh, I just feel less cynical. And, it, and that <laughs> in these days, that's hard sometimes. So uh, thank you all. Thank you, Michael. And we'll conclude with Camila. Hey everyone. Uh, first, thank you for bearing with my fast speaking. I get really excited. Um, I think the thing, uh, I've been trying to write this essay since um, February uh, about the poetics of revision. And uh, I keep talking about leakiness. Um, and I got really excited about leakiness because I think it's sort of like a liberatory quality or, or ethos in the sense that things uh, that don't need to have uh, perimeters or things that don't need to have membranes that separate them can sort of uh, leak into one another. And so I'm really excited about, I guess, the way we sort of ended on architecture, because it makes me think a lot about the need for many of these principles uh, and practices, which are often segregated in specific buildings and specific locations, um, to actually leak. Um, and what does it look like for a young person in high school, for example, to go to a building to like learn one thing, but to then come home to do something else. Um, and it just reminded me uh, of the fact that even though I grew up in a very poor town, the most memorable learning experiences is when my science teacher would take us to San Francisco Creek to collect water samples to analyze it, or when they would take us to Coyote Point to uh, dissect out pellets. Like imagine being this up, now I realize why it was not popular in elementary school, because I was like, let's go dissect out pellets and no one else was saying that. But I think about these as really important experiences. So like, what does it mean for learning to leak into every space versus being contained and sort of the politics of enclosure and containment. Um, yeah, we need to stop. <laughs> let's let things sort of leak and let learning happen uh, whenever, wherever, between whatever species um, it organically can happen between. Out pellets forever, yeah. They're great, you can order them from, from, we can order them. I thought about it a couple of times. My husband's not excited about out pellets in the house. So <laughs> maybe not. Thanks guys. Um, thank you very much. Um, I think that that concludes our program. Um, I just can't say thank you enough. Um, oh, Ju Julie, um, does Collective Question wanna do closing thoughts too? Oh, Julie, we... Steve, and Chris. Yeah, let's do let's do a real quick round round the the yeah. Um, first of all, thank you all. Um, this was really fun and very exciting to kind of have new uh, new breath breathed whatever into this project. Um, and yeah, I don't know. I guess what I'm I'm thinking a lot about right now. Well, Jen brought it up, but. Um, you know, one of the, the sort of cynical things that I remember from this, and I don't want to spend too much time on cynicism, but was the fact that it was trying, that the colleges in general were part of this Berkeley of the East thing that Mayerson um, was really trying to, you know, essentially rebrand uh, University of Buffalo with. And I think one of the things that the tension that really has kind of kept me interested in this project now for five years I guess, well, is the fact that, um, you know, it was trying to be something like that, but yet the sort of lineage and, and the long term, you know, resilience of the people who were part of the colleges um, really were invested in creating this kind of, you know, close knit community and kinship that was really the antithesis of um, that sort of cynicism at the time. And so um, I, I'm really excited now to meet a lot of you all for the first time and also see some of you all again for the first time. And um, I just am hopeful that we can kind of keep talking about poetics and policy and space um, and the new configurations of such, especially for learning um, over the next year and just see how that really shifts and takes on new meaning. So thank you all very much. Steve, do you have any closing thoughts? Um, I want to echo uh, Brianne's comment in the in the chat about how this is timely uh, for the semester, and I think that 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 um, as someone who who is employed to teach 
uh, and not having not been able to generate a whole lot of excitement for the for the act that's that's impending. Uh, this this is actually really um, th this is this has been energizing in a way that you know uh, makes it maybe possible to enter the year on a on a on a on a high note. So thank you for that, Chris. Um, I, I I was thinking exactly the same thing. Um, I'm not ready. We start. No, Chris, you can't say that. No, no, no. You got, no <laughs> what that guy can't possibly. <laughs> But yeah, I'm starting classes next week, and uh, I'm not I'm not ready. But uh, you know, but uh, but but actually, I feel empowered to sort of like um, to I feel empowered to not be ready. Uh, uh, it's a and and to be sort of nimble and uh, and poetic and tangential. And uh, uh, I don't know what owl pellets are, but I'm going to look that up now. <laughs> That's my last remark. <laughs> Uh, as a closing thought and announcement, um, well, I want to thank everyone. This really has been phenomenal. Um, and I learned so much from all of you. Um, I want to leave all of you with one image as we are a visual art organization um, and also inspired by Camila's love of interspecies relations. Uh, the largest living organism um, on earth is actually uh, mycelium uh, mushrooms. And um, when you see mushrooms pop up, they're just fruiting. Uh, it's because of rain that mycelium fruits um, uh, mushrooms, and that's what we see. So I think of this conversation as uh, the blooming of a mushroom, um, and the, the mycelium, our connections are underground, <laughs> and it'll continue to thrive, and you will continue to see um, these fruits pop up. Uh, if you follow us <laughs> as a curator of UV Art Galleries, I encourage all of you to uh, follow our activities by signing up for our newsletter. That way you will receive um, news about all of our activities, um, including future, um, future uh, Tolstoy related um, uh, exhibitions programs. However, there are so many other things that we do that are in the spirit of this generous open conversation and learning and connecting through art. So really I encourage all of you to um, keep coming back and see what we are up to. Um, yeah, on that note, uh, thank you so much. Um, we are so privileged to have all of the speakers tonight and uh, to have all of you join. Thank you so much and have great dinner or have a great evening of sleep. <laughs> Bye. Bye everyone. Take care of yourselves. Bye everyone. <laughs>